This is Stefan with his talk on iOS kernel heap Armageddon. Let's give it up for Stefan. Uh, thank you. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so um, let's get started. I have uh, far too many slides, so uh, I hope I'm not too fast. Um, yeah, the, the title of the talk is iOS kernel heap Armageddon um, because it's um, showing a lot of stuff about the iOS kernel heap and some new way or, yeah, to exploit the iOS kernel heap. Yeah, I can skip through that. I'm, I'm from Germany, I'm from Cologne, and in the past I did a lot of PHP stuff, now I do iOS stuff, and yeah. Okay, in the beginning, a little bit, uh, a small disclaimer. So I might mention iOS 6 throughout the talk several times. Um, so whatever I say about iOS 6 is, uh, well, maybe changing tomorrow because iOS 6 is uh, in beta. And uh, because the beta is only uh, available to re registered iOS developers, I would be on an NDA if I like talk about iOS 6. But I don't have an iOS developer account, so I cannot break the NDA. So everything I, I talk is basically information that was leaked to me. Okay, so uh, why this talk? Um, when, when you look at the, the past research of the iOS kernel heap, you will see that uh, basically uh, it's, it was always similar based on the work from Nemo, uh, who did this for uh, macOS. Um, so in iOS it's a lot similar, so there's a kernel heap zone allocator. Uh, it comes with heap metadata. Uh, this can be exploited, and this is one possible way. So uh, basically everything that was said before about the iOS kernel heap is exactly summarized like that. So I, I want to talk about something different. So of course in the, in the beginning I will just wrap up the, uh, what's known be beforehand uh, about the iOS kernel zone allocator. And, um, but I will talk about other kernel heap managers and wrappers that are existing, uh, about recent changes in these allocators, um, about the idea to have cross zone attacks. Uh, I will get into this later, what's, what is meant by that. And we know that from like user space heap exploitation, and nowadays you don't go after the heap metadata, you go after the uh, application data, and so I will talk about some kind of uh, kernel application data that you can override to get code execution. And in the end, I will present a generic heap massage technique for the iOS kernel heap. Well, much similar to what you do with JavaScript and browsers. Okay, let's get into this zone allocator quite fast. So the idea of the zone uh, allocator inside the kernel is that the kernel heap is uh, divided into uh, so-called zones, and each zone starts with a first chunk of memory, and it's usually like one page, but it can also be multiple pages. It depends on the definition of the zone. So when you want to see what zones are existing, there's a tool called setprint, which also works on uh, macOS, and when you uh, execute that uh, command, it will show you, um, yeah, all the zones. Um, yeah, and you can see here that there's a lot of information about each zone. First, you have the name of the zone, you have the size of the elements in the zone, um, the current size of all the memory that is allocated to the zone, uh, the maximum size for this zone, yeah, the number of elements, the, number, the maximum number of elements, how many of these elements are in use at the moment, the allocation size. Uh, this is basically what I meant. Uh, you see a lot of 4K. These are all the zones that have one page uh, yeah, zone, uh, zone uh, elements. And uh, there's some zones that have a, they're the bigger. So every time the zone has to be increased in size, they will allocate more than one page. But the majority of zones are just 4K zones. So here's the first time I mentioned iOS 6. So basically this setprint tool is uh, based on some uh, Mach APIs that give uh, all this information to user space. And uh, in iOS 6, Apple has closed these uh, APIs 
uh, by checking if uh, yeah, the function PE I can has debugger. So this should be only true on Apple debugging hardware that most probably exists and on jailbroken devices. So on a, on a factory, uh, you shouldn't be able to execute that on a factory device. So therefore, it's no longer usable for kernel heap exploits. So in the past, this was used because it gives all this information, uh, like I, I go back, so it gives you like the elements, the current number of elements, and so, and so on. So it's very nice to know this information if you want to do heap massaging. But Apple has closed that road. So now you have to use different techniques. OK, so let's continue with the stone allocator. So basically, we had like allocators this first page. And now uh, this stone is divi divided into memory blocks of the same size. For example, you have a stone where each element is, in this case, uh, 512 bytes in size. So uh, each element in, inside the stone is uh, 512 uh, bytes. And once this is divided, logically, then uh, the heap manager like, uh, ensures that it remembers these blocks. And um, the first four bytes of each free block is a pointer to another free block. So each time a new uh, page is added to the zone, um, it will add all these uh, f new free blocks to a, a free list. And it does that in, uh, yeah, it does that in the opposite direction. No, it builds the free list, so it first puts in the first element and so on. And of course, therefore, the head of the free list at the end is the last one that was uh, in inserted. And therefore, uh, the memory is actually used backwards. So the first time you allocate, you get like the last element and the next and so on. So when you allocate memory, it's not like you allocate something and then the next element would be afterwards. It's before in a completely fresh zone. Yeah, so uh, of course there's this free list and when memory is allocated, uh, the uh, allocator looks into the head of the free list that is stored in the zone structure and this points to a free block. And what happens now is it will take the first four bytes of this block and um, yeah, because that is the pointer to the next element, it will take this pointer, make this the new head of the free list and then it will return the free block. So in case of a buffer overflow uh, from one uh, yeah, allocated blo memory block into a free memory block, you can of course override the, uh, the, the, the pointer to the next element in the free list and therefore you control the uh, next pointer that's returned when, um, no, when this element that is, was free, when this is returned by the zone allocator, then you overwrote the first four bytes, and that means at this point, these first four bytes will become the head of the free list. So you basically control uh, where the next uh, allocation, or no, what memory block is returned as the next memory block for the al allocation. So, of course, Apple has seen all this, and um, now uh, in iOS 6, they have changed this a, li this a little bit. So you must know in the past there were already some debugging code that would like do more checks and uh, overwrite all the memory and uh, use some kind of tagging. But this was always disabled on, on uh, factory phones. And now in the iOS 6 betas, it seems to be that uh, there's now a memory tagging that uh, writes a fixed value after the uh, free list pointer. This doesn't stop the, uh, the exploitation at all. It only stops the exact vector that was used uh, in all the public iOS heap exploits. So what was done in all these public iOS ex heap exploits is they would like make the head of the free list some pointer in the middle of the syscall table, and uh, then in the next allocation would return actually a pointer inside the syscall table, and the next, when the kernel writes data into this uh, memory block, then the syscall table is overwritten, and you can control where the code execution goes. And of course, because um, now there's this memory tagging, 
and you don't have this tag value somewhere in the syscall table, you cannot return a pointer inside the syscall table anymore. So this just fixes this one pass, but still a lot of other ways to exploit this are open. Okay, so this was all this information, well, except for the iOS 6 uh, editions. So this is the information that is basically public until today. Oh, well, actually, everything here is public because I gave this talk before. But uh, this is basically that was, this was the information that was originally maybe done by Nemo and then ported by me to iOS. And this is what the last year everybody was talking about. This is what's used by all these public jailbreaks at the moment. So now let's look at the other mappers and wrappers. So this is not a complete list, but you can see here, there's a bunch of function inside the kernel that get used to allocate memory. Uh, on the right side, on the left side, for example, you see some operators, new and um, new array. This is because there's some C++ inside the kernel. So, but you can see there that this basically uses kern OS malloc, and this in, uh, again uses kalloc, and so on. And you can see uh, what function inside the kernel calls another function. And in the end, most of this ends in kernel memory allocate or in uh, set alloc, which itself are, uh, they are, they are interworked themselves. So um, this is basically uh, what you need to know. There's like this hierarchy of, uh, of uh, memory mappers, but most of them are just wrappers and uh, they call other memory mappers. Let's start uh, with looking at k-alloc. k-alloc is basically uh, a wrapper around either z-alloc or k-mem alloc, and it ad adds no additional heap metadata. So uh, it's most probably not interesting uh, to look at it for you know, exploitation purposes because there's no extra heap metadata. Uh, the special thing here is um, whenever you use set alloc, you need to know uh, a zone this me memory block is stored in. And because k alloc allows you to um, allocate arbitrary sizes, uh, the caller has to keep cr track of uh, uh, the allocated size, so that it can, uh, when it frees the element, that, it, that the uh, allocator still knows in what zone this uh, memory was put in. So, and, and the thing is, for small uh, memory requests, the zone allocator is used, and for bigger requests, the kmem alloc uh, is used. And uh, like I said before, k alloc needs to de determine the zone, and basically k alloc creates a bunch of own zones. You can see these zones with uh, uh, zprint again. And this is like an output from iOS 5. So you can see there's a bunch of zones. And uh, nowadays, uh, these zones are not necessary powers of 2. In the past, uh, there were only powers of 2 starting with 16. Now there's, uh, they're starting at 8 bytes and uh, have some completely uh, yeah, not power of two numbers in there, like 48 or 112, 88, and so on. Um, well, the, I, I guess the, the reason for that is that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of memory allocated in these intermediate zones. And uh, by making the zone size smaller, the, uh, the element size, um, you don't waste so much many, uh, memory, and so that's better for like a mobile device. Um, yeah, as I, as I said in, in earlier talks, uh, changing the smallest block to 8 bytes is actually quite useful for some exploit, uh, exploits. Um, yeah. Okay, so like I said before, uh, there's k-alloc and there's k-free for uh, freeing the memory again. And there's some kind of protection in this whole k-free code pass uh, because um, in the end, when it frees memory, there's, uh, it keeps track of the largest allocated memory block. Actually, uh, the, the memory mem mapper below that, the kmem memory allocate, is doing that. Um, so they keep track of the largest allocated memory block. And if you try to free something that is larger than this block, this is just a knob. So it will just ignore, be ignored. So this will also not crash. So it will just be a knob. And uh, I think it increases the counter inside the kernel, but uh, I don't think anybody cares about this counter. 
Okay, uh, so KALOC didn't bring any kind of heap metadata, so it didn't, it's just a wrapper and not, not interesting for exploitation. But there's another memory, um, memory allocator called underscore malloc. And this is again a wrapper around KALOC, and it adds um, extra heap metadata to the uh, allocated memory block. And this is like, um, it adds a four byte header which contains the size of the block. So uh, the, the caller of um, malloc doesn't need to keep track of the allocated size because the allocated size is basically inside the block itself. And there's a special specialty about this function. Uh, unless kalloc, it doesn't allow you to allocate zero bytes uh, memory blocks. So if you do, if you do a um, malloc of zero bytes, it will return a null pointer. Uh, and you can see that here, inside the code for uh, malloc in uh, iOS 4. And uh, this is just like a slide showing that in iOS 4, there was a possible integer overflow in, inside this function that was silently fixed in iOS 5. And you can also see that uh, a request of null, null bytes is uh, returned, uh, is answered with a null pointer. Yeah, and uh, as I said before, in iOS 5, they now check for uh, this buffer overflow, uh, this integer overflow that could lead to buffer overflows. Um, and now the difference is, uh, basically, you can no longer achieve exec uh, code execution through, through these kind of attacks. So if you can control the argument to uh, malloc, the, the site's argument, and put something very large inside, you can only cause a kernel panic. Okay, so what happens when you overwrite uh, data that is uh, um, allocated by malloc? It's, um, yeah, you can only overwrite uh, the size field, which, because it's the only extra metadata. And uh, this allows you two different things. If you write a value in there that is smaller, then um, when it's returned to the memory, uh, you basically leak mem memory because it will be, uh, the large uh, buffer will be returned into a zone that is uh, supposed to have smaller memory elements, so there's a lot of memory that leaked in this case. And in the other case, if you write a bigger value in there, then uh, the memory uh, manager will return it to the wrong zone, which is uh, expecting larger memory blocks than this actually is. So this means the next time this fake element in this, in this uh, bigger zone is returned, and the kernel writes into it, it's actually writing into a zone field element that is supposed to be much smaller, and then you can like, then you have a normal buffer overflow. Okay, so as I mentioned before, there's this kern OS malloc, and new and new array, and they are very similar, like malloc, especially this kern OS malloc. It's more, it looks a little bit like copy and paste, which means they also uh, copied the uh, integer overflow, and they didn't fix that integer overflow in this position. So um, if you find a place where you can uh, yeah, influence the, the size argument to kern or malloc, you can still trigger this uh, integer overflow and yeah, exploit it possibly. I think at the moment uh, there is no such call, but maybe in the future. Well, I guess tomorrow this bug is fixed. Uh, anyway, so... Um, yeah, but aside from that, it's, it's very similar to, um, to malloc, and the uh, operator's new and new uh, array just uh, wrap around it. Ah, yeah, there's a special case for the new array al uh, allocator, uh, because when you try to uh, register an array uh, of uh, zero bytes, uh, of zero elements, then it will return a, a buffer of one byte. Okay, so the next thing is this uh, mcache slab allocator, and um, that is very complicated and uh, doesn't fit into this talk because uh, otherwise I can talk like for hours. And um, so maybe in the future this is a talk by itself. And uh, so the last one that was interesting here is this kernel memory allocate. But when you look at it, um, I think Apple, I think this is a quote from the Apple source code. It's called the master entry point for allocating kernel memory. And um, it alloc allocates uh, a memory in specific memory maps, and it always allocates uh, whole pages 
and uh, if you request a lot of memory, more than one meg uh, gigabyte, it will fail and just return a null pointer. I believe it returns a null pointer and doesn't crash. Um, yeah, and it keeps metadata, but it keeps that in a, in a different position than the memory itself. So the, mem uh, the, key, uh, the metadata is outbound and uh, not inbound. So when you overflow some block with, that was uh, allocated with kernel memory allocate, you're not accidentally overwriting the, the metadata. So this seems very uninteresting for now. Okay, so the next thing that I was interested in is, okay, we, now we know how to exploit uh, attacks against a zone allocator, but what about, for example, I have an overflow in a um, KLOG 32 bi uh, byte uh, zone. Uh, what about um, another zone? Maybe there's something interesting like, like a, a function table that is stored in a, in a zone that's called a blob and it's also 32 bytes. So the only question is, can I uh, like, or a different size. So the question is, can I see if these zones are in memory uh, ne right next to each other? Is the position like, uh, yeah, can I massage the heap in a way that uh, one zone is exactly behind the other and so on? So I did some experiments. Yeah, okay, that's what I said. So I want to see what's the, what's the position, the relative position of uh, kernel zones to each other um, what's the position of pages inside the same kernel zone? So if I have like a full page and I overflow the last block inside a page, what will happen? Will it crash because there's no memory afterwards? Or can I uh, abuse the memory manager in a way so that the next zone that is added to this, uh, the next page that is added to this zone is basically in memory behind it? Yeah, and what is about, can I do a kernel level heap spray? So, okay, so and what I did is uh, I did an experiment. I patched uh, an iOS kernel mm. to give me directly access to the k-alloc function. Uh, no, z-alloc, no, k-alloc, uh, to the k-alloc function and basically from user space I could just call k-alloc and it would, would return the, uh, the pointer to user space so I can see what pointers are returned by k-alloc easily. And what you can see in iOS 5 is that everything that is returned is between these uh, values, uh, 8, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, and, um, and so on, and 8, f, 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 f. Uh, basically you can like, make it even smaller um, but let's let, let it like this. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to vi visualize where in memory are these allocations. So I just wrote a simple user space uh, tool that would allocate 48 megabytes of kernel memory and then just visualize where in memory these pages are. So in the beginning, uh, you don't see much. After like 100 allocations, I think that you cannot see it uh, so good. There are some in the lower third, maybe there are some red dots, and all over the place there are some smaller red dots, but yeah, there's basically a line. Okay, but now do more allocations. You can, s I don't know if, can you see that? I th yeah, because from here it looks like uh, you cannot see it because the color is too bad. Okay, so I, I would just do more allocations and you can see it gets red more and more and more, and, but it's basically all over the place. Okay, so, oh no, that was the last one. Okay, so you can see uh, basically the pages that were returned are completely um, distributed over the uh, area. Of course, in the beginning, there's this black box because it's like actually the kernel image and the heap is behind that. Um, what's interesting here is while it's very random, you can see that there are cl uh, clusters. So in the top, there's very, very much red. So it seems that while, uh, also it seems random. Um, actually, there's a, a high uh, probability that the memory is uh, up there. So what I did next is I saw the, okay, now let's try that again. Try this actually 25 times, which is very, hard 
if you uh, have to do uh, 25 times in d going to df um mode and uh, do lime rain exploit and then like boot this uh, patch kernel and so on. So it took a while. Um, but in the end, I had all these uh, results and uh, now tried to like overlay the results. So what I did now is I just uh, added all the pixels to each other and uh, divide them by the, um, yeah, 25 reboots. So you can see here, um, there's still, in average, there's still a large cluster in the beginning, which is very red, so uh, the memory is quite often returned uh, up there. So the next thing I did was, okay, now let's check if actually the memory pages that are returned are common. So is there one page or is there a set of pages that is returned in all 25 reboots? And yeah, in 25 reboots, I found one page that was always allocated. Problem was then I tried this six, uh, 26 time and then it was uh, not allocated. So uh, basically, basically that means, um, um, yeah, you cannot have one fixed address that you maybe uh, hard code and you cannot ensure that uh, with a lot of uh, um, allocated memory that you actually have allocated this, this uh, piece of memory. So heap spraying uh, is basically not really feasible. However, I forgot that to say that on the first slide. The problem here is this only, or the good thing here is this only applies to the, the, the zones that are single page zone. So this only applies to these zones where one page is all added to, uh, to the zone uh, when the mem memory run out, runs out. Um, memory that's allocated in, in, in zones where there are multiple pages is um, handled differently and it usually are pointers above C000000, yeah? Yeah? Uh, actually, uh, I, I, so, so far I only did these experiments. I didn't search for this randomness. So far I didn't find this code by accident or so, but uh, I didn't explicitly search for this. Uh. Okay, so what I wanted to say here, there's other zones where there are multiple pages uh, allocated at, uh, at once. Um, and these zones basically are allocated above C000000. And um, those are actually at your send. So if you, uh, if you choose memory from these zones, you can do a, a heap spray and actually have predictable addresses. Okay, this is all only true for um, iOS 5. So with iOS 6, there's this kernel ISLR. Um, I'm not a developer, so I didn't test it yet. Um, it might be now different, uh, so that you cannot ever rely on, on a heap spraying in this case. Okay, so the result from this is uh, you cannot just overflow out of outside of a, a zone page because there's a high probability that the memory after this page is actually not allocated. So if you overflow at the end of a page, then it will just crash. So all your attacks must be always in the same page. Um, and then the question was, yeah, when you look at cross-memory allocator attacks, like I have one memory block that's allocated with k-alloc and the other one is like allocated with current OS malloc or so, so the question is, uh, if I overflow this one memory block from, a, from one allocator, can I overflow into the other one? And the answer is yes, that it's possible because, uh, uh, yeah, it's possible for all those allocators that basically in the end all call this set alloc allocator. Like, you can overflow memory from new, uh, so you can overwrite objects from a k alloc area and so on. And that, that's what brought me to the next idea. So now the question is, um, I don't want to attack heap um, metadata, I want to attack heap application data. And so in this case I do a C++ object case study. Um, of course, there could be other kinds of things inside the kernel, like maybe function tables that you can overwrite. But for now, I'm just interested in um, C++ objects. 
because inside the iOS kernel there is this IO kit interface and um, there's this libkern which supports C++ for kernel drivers. And uh, yeah, I think outside of IO kit it's absolutely not used. So everything that's uh, C++ inside inter the kernel is somehow related to IO kit or to the implementation of the C++ thing. Um, and uh, the runtime, the C++ runtime it comes with, so it's not a full runtime, it's just like a small runtime. Um, and uh, the runtime it comes with has, uh, comes with a, a, a set of base objects that are below the actual I.O. kit uh, objects. So and these base objects are uh, shown here. So you have something called OS object and uh, nearly all of the objects are basically derived from that. And then you have like collections like uh, sets, ordered sets, dictionaries, and OS arrays. And you have a bunch of other things like data, strings, numbers, booleans, yeah, and something called the iterator, which is used to iterate over uh, like collections. So now, when you look at these OS objects in memory, they will look like this. Um, this looks very much like C++ objects in browsers, or like in user space. Um, so you have like, in the beginning, you have like uh, the vtable pointer. And uh, in the case of the OS object, object you only have uh, one property, which is the retain counter, which is some kind of reference counter. And uh, the vtable pointer is pointing into the, uh, I think, const segment of the, of the kernel. And this is basically the list of uh, property, uh, the, the list of uh, uh, methods of this object. Well, the virtual functions. Okay, um, so the other thing that's in this object is this retain count, which is actually interesting because it's not a simple reference counter. It's a 32-bit field that is split into two halves, um, and the lower 16 bits are real reference counter, and the upper 16 bits are a collection reference counter. So um, the kernel keeps track how often this object is inside a collection. And the funny thing here is that the reference counting stops at uh, 65,534, and if you have like an object that, had, that has, uh, has more references, or when it tries to create more references, we'll just like ignore those um, and not increase them, but it will also not decrease them anymore. The moment it, uh, this number is, uh, is hit, it's just frozen. So this object cannot be freed anymore. So this is very simple. If you have a way to create that many references, you can leak memory and just easily crash the kernel by just creating a lot of objects. Because in the end, the kernel doesn't have memory anymore. Excuse me? Uh, so what's the use of upper 16 bits then? Is it for optimization? Or? Um, like I said, the other 16 bits are the reference counter. So he asked what the other, res uh, the other, uh, the other reference counter is used for the upper ones. So. Mm, this is, like I said, just collects how often this uh, um, is, you, uh, is added to uh, collections. And I believe it's only used, yeah, I think it's only used inside the deallocation to see if suddenly the original reference counter drops under this collection reference counter. And in this case, the kernel panic is thrown. I think this is the only place where this is actually used inside the kernel. So it's basically waste. Okay, now the interesting thing, what, what happens if you have like this uh, object in memory and you override it? So, because there are only like two things in there, so you can only override these two things. And um, when you look at browser exploits, you see they always try to override the vtable pointer. And uh, you can do that the same in, in the iOS kernel. You just override the vtable pointer and the next time the kernel tries to do anything with this object, it will uh, basically use uh, the function table you, uh, you supplied by overwriting the pointer. Okay, in this case, it might be tricky to actually have, uh, yeah, you have to put this function table somewhere in kernel memory and then like, uh, let it point uh, to it. Um, but yeah, of course, you can do that with information leaks and all this kind of stuff. 
And the other thing that you can override is like the retain count. And um, this might allow you to introduce use after free vulnerabilities into the code. And then you can exploit them like normally, like, uh, like let the object be freed, get a, a new memory in the same place, and then you again control the vtable pointer and, and so on. So let's uh, look at a different object. So you have the OS string object. And this has uh, uh, some more properties. So you can do more. Um, for example, when you overwrite the flex field, you can control if in the end on the destruction of this object, if the, uh, it, if the kernel tries to free the, the string or not. So again, you can do this uh, attacks like returning this into the wrong uh, k so and so on. No, wait, wait a sec. So now the next element that you can overwrite is the length. And this is basically similar to when you overwrite uh, the length field inside a malloc block. So you can like put it in the wrong k log zone and therefore it will use either, it will be useful for heap information leaks or uh, for um, like freeing memory into the wrong zone. So that you can maybe trigger a buffer overflow afterwards. Or sometimes you maybe just want to leak memory for heap massage. Um, yeah, and the, next, the last thing you can overwrite is the string pointer itself. The string pointer is basically a, a value that is allocated with k-alloc, and it just contains the, the string. So of course, if you can overwrite this pointer and later read the string, uh, for example, through the registry and the I.O. registry, then um, uh, you can leak kernel heap information. Or again, you can free arbitrary pointers uh, uh, the moment this uh, string object is uh, destroyed. The next thing that's interesting is the OS array uh, memory layout. And this is a, lit a little bit more complicated. So you have like far more properties in this case. And one of these uh, properties is the array pointer. And the array pointer is also allocated with k alloc. And it uh, allocates uh, capacity times size of void pointer. So basically, it, it allocates uh, a table um, yeah, of pointers that all point to either to null, if there's nothing in there, or to an other object. So that means if you uh, can overwrite the array pointer or the array itself, you can basically make the kernel uh, use uh, OS objects that are actually fake objects and they are supplied by you. And any action the kernel performs on these objects, again, will result in code execution. And if you overwrite all the other fields in there, the count, the capacity, and so on, then again, you can do this kind of things like uh, um, info leaks because you can like read uninitialized memory, or you can again do these confusing attacks to uh, so that memory is returned into the wrong uh, catalog zone and so on. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's um, also. Uh, two properties called uh, update stamp and um, f options. And I think they are not really usable. So if you overwrite them, you don't, uh, you don't can leverage that for code execution. Okay, so this is just like a short introduction of how these uh, C++ objects lo lo uh, look inside the memory. And now you should know that by overwriting them, you can do like uh, execute code inside the kernel, like you can also do in browsers. Okay, and now that we know that we can that we have these objects, the question is, can we like um, do a kernel heap massage in a way that's like a little bit more generic and that allows us to override these kind of kernel objects? So uh, when we look at heap controlling techniques, there are basically two. This is heap spraying, which basically is just filling up the kernel heap with arbitrary uh, data. And then there's this heap feng shui or heap massage, heap setup, heap layout control. There's so many uh, different groups of people that uh, prefer to call it differently. Um, so um, in the end, it's all the same technique. Um, the idea is 
we have like an unknown start state and we want to bring the kernel heap into a, a known state and doing this by carefully crafting allocations and deallocations. And when you look at the public uh, exploits that already exploit the heap for iOS, uh, I think there are only two, mine and the one from Poti2G, um, they always use very vulnerability specific ways to allocate and deallocate. So it's not generic at all. And my idea was I wanted to have a more generic solution that can be used for all kinds of uh, overflows. Well, uh, not all, but many of them. Okay, let's look again. Heap spraying means we need something to allocate repeatedly. We need to be able to allocate attacker controlled data. We need to be able to allocate large quantities of data in a row. And usually we want to fill the memory with some specific pattern. Heap Feng Shui, on the other hand, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, we want to allocate repeatedly, repeatedly to actually close all the memory holes. Um, we want to be able to allocate arbitrary sized memory blocks. We want to be able to poke holes into these allocations uh, so that we can control the memory layout. And of course, we want to fill the memory with interesting data, application data, so that we, when actually trigger the vulnerability and overflow something, we want to overflow something or to heap corrupt something that is basically interesting to corrupt. So, and when I, when I looked at the iOS curl, I found a very useful function, which is called OS unserialized XML. So what, what is this function? This function is a kernel function, so a user space cannot call it directly, but uh, basically, no, not all, but a lot of IOKit IO API, API functions will allow the user to submit um, like objects in plist format and XML plist format, and then the kernel will basically unserialize this XML to create objects. For example, when you open an IOKit driver, you can give it a, a bunch of properties uh, it should start with, and then it will call this, uh, this function to like, um, deserialize the properties. But there are like many other things, like when you want to, to match something, you also supply this. And uh, in, in many API functions, you basically uh, are able to pass user control data to, or you're supposed to pass user control data to this uh, OS unserialized XML. And this is very powerful because it can create, yeah, well, the data, the data t types, um, no, the data objects among the, the base objects. So you can create numbers, you can create booleans, strings, data, uh, the, the dictionaries, arrays, sets, and you can also create references. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, um, in plist format, so you can see it's XML. And you see in this case, it's a dictionary with uh, three keys inside and uh, the first key is, is there and there's a, a string value. The second key uh, has a, a Boolean true value and the last key is again a string value. Oh yeah, before the talk I removed a bunch of slides uh, because that would be just too complicated and it's not really uh, useful in this case. So uh, this is a leftover that might be uh, useful or not in this case. So the thing is just, um, the idea here is uh, it's a memory size cheat sheet. So if you create an OS array in memory, the OS array itself is 36 bytes in size, but because it's allocated through k-alloc, it's put into a, uh, on the k-alloc 40 zone. And additionally, when you create this OS array um, object, you will create, uh, you will uh, allocate more mem memory, which is capacity times four because inside an array you only have pointers to the objects of the elements because an array is just a, a numerical index from zero to the end and so you don't need to be, keep track of tr um, keys. Uh, which, which is different for OS dictionaries. There you have the capacity times eight because you always have two pointers. The first pointer is the key, the second pointer is the um, value. Yeah, and so on. So um, and this is just like my sheet sheet. So when I want to look up uh, 
how should I construct that? Uh, um, yeah, in what zone these objects will end in the end? Okay, so how is it useful? Um, looking, back, let's look back at uh, heap spraying. Remember, we want to do these four things. We want to allocate repeatedly. We want to allocate attacker control data, large quantities, and fill it with a specific data uh, pattern. Unfortunately, there is no, no way to loop inside uh, the plists. So if you want to uh, allocate large quantities, you have to create, in this case, we use an array. We just create an array with many elements. So when you pass that to the kernel, um, it will create uh, first a dictionary, then inside the dictionary again an array, and inside the array will be a lot of strings. Yeah, and um, when you look at, um, I prepared this slide, um, when you look at this, this will look like this in memory. So you have uh, the different k alloc zones and something which I call large because it will just be a very large block that will most probably not even be in your, in your normal k alloc zones. Well, depends on how much memory you want to allocate. And then you can see in each zone which, uh, what is created inside there and what is uh, yet sent to each other if like, the, the heap is cleaned in this case. So, um, yeah, you can see that uh, it always starts with the OS dictionary object, which is like 40, 40 bytes in size, and this points to like, uh, uh, yeah, the dictionary key and dictionary value. In, in, in our example, we just had like one element in there, so it's just like eight bytes. So you see it's in the k alloc 8 zone, and this, the, the key pointer points to the actual key, and the dictionary value points to an array, which is again in the k-log 40. This points to the uh, array buckets, which is like in some large memory block. And inside the array pointer, in the, inside the array buckets, there are pointers to all the OS string objects, which are 24 bytes, no, 20 bytes in size, but they end up in the 24 bytes uh, set alloc zone. And each of these elements points to a string, which is like, uh, I think nine bytes long, so it doesn't fit in the AK alloc eight, so it was put into K, into K alloc 16 zone. Yeah, so you can see by uh, like just repeatedly uh, ordering the kernel to create objects, it is able to be created. And by doing a very long plist, you can create a lot of elements. Okay, so uh, so far we can allocate repeatedly and we can allocate large quantities of data. So now we want to solve the other things. Yeah, the next thing we want to do is to allocate uh, attacker control data. Uh, we already saw, yeah, we can use strings, but the problem with strings is they are not completely attacker controlled because uh, strings cannot contain null, uh, null uh, bytes. So in order to have null bytes in your attacker controlled uh, spray, you, you need to use a data tag which allows you to create uh, like data blobs in memory, objects with beta, data blobs. And the nice thing here is there are two different ways to specify that. Uh, you can I either encode them base64, or you, uh, the kernel also supports a hex format. So you can just like, do it like this. And again, I have, oh yeah, and the nice thing here is when you do the string thing, the, string, the parser actually creates a string um, that might interfere with the memory that's allocated in the k-alloc zone. So that you don't have this problem when you use data, because uh, data blobs are passed always in chunks of 4,096 uh, 40, uh, 4, bytes. So these are most probably not the, the exact size that you want to attack. It's, not in, it's, it's in like in the, in the big zone. So uh, when it like passes this, it will not confuse the rest of the memory. Okay, and this allocation looks like this. Uh, again, you have the dictionary, which points to, uh, to the buckets, and the buckets contain the, the key and the, the array, and the array in this case contains OS data uh, objects, and they point to uh, arbitrary memory blobs. So this basically means um, all four, um, yeah, properties that we need, uh, all four things that we need to do for a heap spray are easily possible with a plist. You just have to make a long plist and uh, put in the data you want to spray the heap with. So heap feng shui is a little bit more complicated. 
So again, we want to allocate repeatedly, but we already know that's easy. Uh, we already know that's easy, and uh, we don't need to like find a new solution because we have the solution. And we also can allocate arbitrary size memory blocks because we can allocate strings and data, and we can make them short and, and long. But it's only orange here because if I overwrite a string, it's most probably not, not interesting for me. I want to have uh, arbitrary sized blocks that contain useful information that, uh, when I overwrite it. OK, so how can I fill arbitrary sized memory blocks with actually data when I, when I overwrite it? It's useful for, to me. And uh, like I said before, for strings and data, this is actually uh, not really useful because these are just strings and data. And if you, if you overwrite them, it's maybe useful for information leakage, but it's not useful for actually code execution. So what I want to do is I want to uh, uh, allocate uh, arbitrary sized blocks that are filled with, in this case, pointers to OS objects. And uh, this is very easy because I can just create arrays with an arbitrary number of elements. And each element in the, inside the array is uh, like a pointer to an object. And if I manipulate this pointer, I can achieve code execution. So if I want to allocate like 344 bytes, I will just put the size and divide it by four. And then I know how many elements I need to put into the uh, array. And of course, uh, I can do the same attack with dictionaries. In this case, I have to divide it by eight. Um, yeah, and you can see here, uh, in this case, I always fill them with Boolean values because it makes the plist very short, and I can create a lot of elements with a very short plist. Um, but in this case, I'm only interested to have like these uh, array buckets that are in the size that I need them to be. Again, if you look at the uh, uh, how this looks in memory, it's quite it looks quite complicated, but what you need to know is just like you have like uh, all the memory blocks in the different zones. And uh, interesting here is that when the kernel creates booleans with OS uh, unserialized XML, it doesn't really create the objects. It creates uh, references to global true and false values. So in this case, um, all the Booleans that are inserted into these array buckets are actually not using more memory. They are just like using the pointer that is needed because the pointer points to the uh, global object. And this just increases and decreases the reference counter. And uh, yeah, so in this case, there is no additional memory allocated for the elements inside the array because they are all like global pointers. So, and this means we now have, uh, are able to uh, allocate arbitrary sized memory blocks and additionally have them filled with stuff. If, I, if you overwrite that or manipulate that, then we basically are already near code execution. So the next thing and the last thing we need is we need to be able to poke holes into this. And now you think, well, okay, you just give it objects and it creates these objects, but why should it like allow you to poke holes? And it actually doesn't allow you to do that, just like how it's implemented that it's possible. Um, because when you have a dictionary, um, you can insert stuff into, into the dictionary and give it like keys, arbitrary keys. Um, and you can see in this, uh, in this example, I insert A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 E, 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 and in the end, I insert C, 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 C again. And what happens now is that uh, when it tries to add it to the, to the dictionary, it will see, oh, there's already an element with the same key, and it will just destroy the old uh, allocated memory and um, yeah, replace that value, in this case, again, with a, with a uh, global pointer to this global Boolean true. So uh, that looks like this. You have like this dictionary with uh, the, a very large uh, yeah, um, bucket for each uh, dictionary key and value. And they point to the keys and they point to the data. And the data, of course, points to the data. And you can see in the, mid, in, in the middle there, there's this set, 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 set. And we want to get rid of this set. 
So we just allocate some new value for CCCC. And then you have uh, now instead a pointer to this global true value, and the OS data object and the, point, the data it points to is are freed. So this is how you can poke arbitrary sized holes in, into uh, the allocation. And when you combine all that, uh, of course, um, you have everything that you need to do an actual heap spray or heap uh, feng shui. Yeah. And that's basically more or less the end. Just uh, a last slide for, uh, there's a special gimmick. If you just want to crash the kernel, uh, then you can just uh, use the same function by, uh, you just create um, some objects, and then you create references to it, and a lot of them. And uh, this means this memory will never be freed after the IO kit uh, API returns. And then you call it se several times until the kernel runs out of memory, and then there you have a, like a kernel crash. Yeah, any questions? A little bit uh, of like advertisement for our book. Um, yeah, if you want to get into iOS kernel, exploitation or iOS exploitation, you should really look into this book. But are there any questions? Everybody wants to go to lunch. <laughs>